Organic life beneath the shoreless waves was born and nursed in ocean's pearly caves. First forms minute, unseen by spheric glass, move on the mud or pierce the watery mass. These, as successive generations bloom, new powers acquire and larger limbs assume, whence countless groups of vegetation spring and breathing realms of fin and feet and wing. This poem was included in a compilation called The Temple of Nature, written by Erasmus Darwin in 1802, seven years before the birth of his grandson Charles. Even in Erasmus's day, uh, other people had already realized that life was obviously, obviously connected, though they couldn't tell how interrelated it was. Other people were already proposing hypotheses of how different species might have emerged. In fact, mm -hmm. Erasmus should get credit for having first explained the mechanism of sexual mm -hmm. selection and even the first hint of natural selection, though he didn't extrapolate that as far as Charles did. Erasmus Darwin was one of the most influential intellects of his day, just for the general populace, so there's no doubt but that he also influenced Charles, too. And I've heard people say that, uh, that Charles Darwin didn't have any original ideas, that he just ripped off his grandpa. But reading Erasmus brings us to a different conclusion. In 1794, Erasmus Darwin wrote The Laws of Organic Life in a two-volume medical journal under the primary title Zoonomia. Therein he opined, from thus meditating on the great similarity of the structure of the warm-blooded animals, and at the same time of the great changes they undergo both before and after their nativity, and by considering in how minute a portion of time many of the changes of animals above described have been produced, would it be too bold to imagine that in the great length of time since the earth began to exist, perhaps millions of ages before the commencement of the history of mankind, would it be too bold to imagine that all warm-blooded animals have arisen from one living filament, which the great first cause endued with animality, with the power of acquiring new parts, attended with new propensities, directed by irritations, sensations, volitions, and associations, and thus possessing the faculty of continuing to improve by its own inherent activity and of delivering down those improvements by generation to its posterity, world without end." Unquote. Erasmus Darwin was criticized and publicly parodied over this idea. And note that he speculated about the possibility of common ancestry, but only for warm-blooded animals. He seemed to think that there was a significant difference between uh, humans and quadrupeds, too, and made no reference to uh, where uh, cold-blooded animals should have come from. And although he uh, did list a number of natural mechanisms, which led him to being accused of the, uh, the heinous impiety of materialism, he still credited the great first cause with having endowed these organisms with animality, of making them animate. And despite this, he was somehow slandered as an atheist, too, even though in a later poem called The Production of Life, he reiterated that all this occurred through firm, immutable, immortal laws impressed on nature by the great first cause. And this admittedly sounds like a deist notion, which was obviously popular at the time. But if there's any doubt as to whether Erasmus Darwin believed that this great first cause was the Bible God, we find proof of that in the same volume that got him into, first got him into trouble, wherein he also listed several means of reproduction that were used by various plant and animal species. He included Eve from Adam's rib as one of those reproductive processes, just <laughs> casually inserted into what was the accepted <laughs> biology of the day. So, while the scientific community celebrated Charles Darwin for the, his theory of natural selection, inspired and developed from the obvious influence of his grandfather, what really made Charles famous was his own much more controversial and almost entirely novel idea that all animals, whether warm-blooded or cold-blooded, quadruped or biped, as well as plants too, were all derived from the same living filament, a universal common ancestor. Ancient philosophers had speculated that that might be the case, but Charles proposed the first working mechanism to validate that idea and give it merit. This is the only drawing we have from Charles Darwin. It certainly is most famous, which is amusing, in that this was just a doodle, just the man thinking on paper, having no idea that 160 years later people would buy reprints of this image on coffee mugs and t-shirts. This was just his first attempt to illustrate a tree of life that we are still tracing today. And looking at this drawing, we have to appreciate how much we've learned since Darwin's day that he couldn't have known because he was just starting to piece it all together. 
And those who reject and object to science for religious reasons like to pretend that all we know or believe about evolution is just whatever Charles Darwin told us, as if he was like one of their spiritual prophets. But remember that he was just the first in a long line of scientists to explore this, and most of what we know was figured out after him. He was a pioneer, because in his lifetime we hadn't discovered much of anything yet. The only transitional species known to exist at that time were a few marine invertebrates like ammonites. There weren't enough fossils yet found to trace many transitions, and Darwin was born before the very first of the dinosaur fossils were ever identified. And not only were there no microfossils yet discovered, but microscopy was so new and feeble that very little was known about living microbes either, and no one yet knew anything about genetics. They were just starting to look at embryology and cell biology and hadn't yet discovered any of the volumes of information that evidence that we now have that vindicate Darwin's theory. All he had to go on were the crude ranks of Linnaean taxonomy, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. And that's just what he started with. Prior to that, the classification of all life was that everything was either animal, mineral, or vegetable. And just think that bacteria are on and practically in everything, or pra in practically everything around the world yet, and, and have been for this long before there were even animals. But nobody knew about bacteria until Antony van Leeuwenhoek invented magnifying lenses, forcing us to invent another kingdom of life. Then when you discovered protists, they were called animalcules and were thought to be microscopic animals or plants or fungi, which had to have their own kingdom too. And then they invented kingdom protista, which could have counted for a dozen kingdoms all by itself. And the more we learn, the more incremental stages we discover. So we later inserted a new, few new increments, a supra kingdom, a super family, infra class, parv order, subgenus, and so on. Even a new domain to keep what eventually turned out to be two groups of prokaryotes separate from all the known kingdoms of eukaryotes now seen as one collective. And Darwin drew this tree before anyone yet knew about any of that. When vertebrate animals were classed as either fish, amphibians, reptiles, or mammals, and birds were thought to be something different from reptiles. And some of these classifications we don't even use anymore, at least is not at the way they were originally defined. We know better now, and I'll explain why shortly. Carl Lynn, better known as Carolus Linnaeus, introduced the first concept of taxonomy in a book called Systema Naturae, which was published in 1735, when Erasmus Darwin was only four years old. This was 124 years before Charles Darwin published his theory of evolution by natural selection. There was another uh, earlier notion of evolution, but uh, Linne when Linnaeus published his work, Charles Darwin's predecessor, Jean-Baptiste Pierre Antoine de Monet Chevalier de Lamarck, <laughs> hadn't yet published his notion of evolution by acquired characteristics because he hadn't been born yet. So the difference in perspectives between Charles Darwin and Carolus Linnaeus excuse me, Carolus Linnaeus, is that Linnaeus had no concept of evolution to work from. He didn't even consider that a possibility. Linnaeus was, in a sense, a creationist. He believed that species were immutable, special creations by God, and that, and that uniquely new and distinct species couldn't come into existence any other way than by a, a miraculous act of creation. And when he tried to consider that some limited speciation might be possible, he certainly couldn't imagine it leading to higher taxonomic ranks. Yet, when he categorized living organisms, he found that they were all in daughter groups within a series of parental groups, each a subset of another. The pattern that emerged was kind of like this. And here you can see his seven ranks, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species, illustrated in a branching tree pattern. This one is completely binary. That's not always how it is. Some groups are split in three ways, some four. But in any case, this hierarchy can, o can only be described as a family tree of life. It does not make sense as a list of divinely created, separately unrelated kinds, and Linnaeus had no way to explain this. This is impossible to explain without some means of natural speciation. When Darwin realized that different species of finches had developed from a common ancestor, that meant that natural speciation was possible, that it actually happens. And that's why his book is called On the Origin of Species. Because it's one thing to realize that new breeds or subspecies emerge that are still chemically interfertile with other morphs in that group. That's just microevolution, small-scale variation within species. But speciation is another matter. 
That's macroevolution, large-scale variation between species at or above the species level. And that means that new species can continue to beget newer species, and those changes can continue to accumulate over millions of years in divergent lineages going back many different, direct, many different directions at once, eventually accounting for the whole of biodiversity. With this realization, Darwin turned to Systema Naturae and saw that what was a mystery for Linnaeus suddenly made sense. Because he can envision a population of organisms following each of these branches, with some fish becoming amphibians and some of those adapting into reptiles and eventually branching into mammals and birds, each according to the terms as they were understood in his day. He worked out a mechanism by which that could happen through the formation of new species. When I was a boy, I remember defenders of the faith saying that no one had ever seen a species evolve. But now that speciation has been directly observed and documented dozens of times, you know, both in, in, in the lab and in naturally controlled conditions in the field, they've changed their story. Now they say that they accept speciation and that they always have. But that it doesn't count as evolution somehow because the new organism still belongs to the parent category, that nothing ever turned into a fundamentally or completely different kind of thing unrelated to its own parents. Darwin knew what religious extremists refuse to understand, that evolution never taught and does not allow one thing to turn into another completely different kind of thing, like creationists keep demanding. Instead, every new genus or species that ever evolved still belongs to every parent category that their ancestors did, because evolution is just a matter of incremental, usually subtle, superficial changes being slowly compiled atop successive tiers of fundamental similarities, and those tiers of similarity uh, establish taxonomic clades. Very simply, you start with whatever you've got, make a couple of adjustments, maybe a minor modification, and that becomes the next generation, and that might be modified again further down the road so that the core of the thing, what it is and what continues to be, matters more than variable surface features or appearance. And this was already visionary for that time, because back then, people believed that if you adopt the clothing and behavior of a thing, you could become that thing. That's where the werewolf legend came from. <laughs> and both common people and even scientists back then were superficial, judging everything by how it looked. Linnaeus, for example, shamelessly classified human beings into different species based on whatever color he thought they should be according to what continent they came from. He also amusingly classified chimpanzees and orangutans each as a subset of humans because he said he couldn't tell humans and apes apart. His system couldn't account for evolution, obviously, since he didn't even know that was a thing, but it doesn't work for evolution either because the way his system was set up, our ancestors stopped being reptiles after they stopped being amphibians, after they stopped being fish. And that's a paraphyletic grouping. The problem with that is that this is where an ancestral category includes all of the descendants except for this or that arbitrary exclusion. Why? Tradition! <laughs> Cladistic taxonomy, however, requires a monophyletic classification where every descendant of that clade still belongs to that clade and every ancestral clade beyond that one. You can never grow out of your ancestry. It's like a set of Russian Matryoshka dolls. Even if you and your children start a new category to which your parents do don't belong, you and your children still belong to every category that your parents did. And this is why every new species of fruit fly or finch will of course still be a fly or still be a finch because they can't be anything else, even if they don't look like that anymore. Their ancestry can't change no matter how different they be, their descendants become. And this requires a conceptual correction because if we never stop being fish, then either we're just really weird monkey fish or there's no such thing as a fish since there's no consistent taxonomic definition for that word. So we no longer use taxonomic ranks the way Linnaeus devised them. But we know that what he imagined to be only seven original levels is now up to at least 50 or thereabouts. Nor could he have imagined that as we trace the clades to which we all belong that we're traveling through time, in a sense, because each clade appears in a different period of geologic history, which is another concept that didn't exist in Linnaeus's day. And of course, as we examine each clade the way we understand them now, we're also tracing our own evolutionary heritage. So let's start with the most basic, the broadest possible, and the most inclusive category, life itself. What we know about the early Earth 
is that it was much warmer and more radioactive than it is today. A bubbling cauldron cooking complex chemicals. Now, thanks to Yuri Miller and a number of other similar experiments, we know that water, ammonia, methane, and hydrogen generate amino acids when heated and charged with electricity. The same thing happens when you change the mix to include carbon dioxide, nitrogen, hydrogen sulfide, and sulfur dioxide. Peptides can form spontaneously when you know, drying into polypeptides. Because some of these chemicals become increasingly complex after repeated cycles of inundation, dehydration, and irradiation. Then, once the right phosphate is involved, they become ribonucleotides. If ribonucleotides come into contact with montmorillonite, they spontaneously produce strands of RNA. Activated RNA not only replicate themselves, even without the usual enzyme, it also builds DNA. Then, of course, phospholipids automatically form a bilayered cell wall on contact with water due to their combined polarity, allowing a haven for all these processes, with transport vesicles and other semi-permeable channels to keep fueling and exchanging the system. So if RNA and then DNA are contained within that, in this, that incidental arrangement, we have the first potentially living cells. This is, I think, the simplest way to explain what is really a very complex collection of processes composed by a sequence of, uh, well, it's, a, it's, a, it's not one theory, it's a collection of them in a sequence. And not everything that meets this definition is necessarily alive. What I described might be a hypercycle or a protobiont, the basis of what would become life. We generally consider seven criteria for what counts as life. All life that we know of is based on cells, but they must also do things. They have to break down nutrients to generate energy. They must grow and then replicate. Then in replication, there must be a possibility of mutation to produce variations such that populations of organisms will, ev will evolve over time. Not to become better or mo more complex necessarily, but to produce a variety of different strains to test against dynamic environmental conditions. That is the, one of the criteria to be alive, that it can evolve. It must also respond to stimuli. How can it be alive in any sense if it can't interact with the world around it? And finally, there has to be at least temporarily able to achieve homeostasis, meaning to maintain a balanced internal chemical environment. And this is something all living cells do, but viruses can't do. So viruses and protobionts, which may be related, don't qualify as life, even though they can be killed. And that's why antibiotics don't work on viruses. And now that we are within the category of all things that are definitely alive, we find that the oldest life forms are on and in everything, including our cells. Most of the cells in your body are not yours. There's more bacteria in you than there is you. Yet we didn't know that bacteria even existed until a couple centuries ago. Archaea is even older than bacteria, and we didn't know those existed until a few decades ago. I was a boy when they announced that archaea existed, and then they discovered that they had existed long before everything else. Archaea are extremophiles, capable of surviving intensely hot or poisonous environments that would kill anything else. They and bacteria are both prokaryotes, whereas we are eukaryotes, meaning that each of our cells, including our blood cells, at least initially, have a nucleus. Our type of cells are uh, bigger than bacterial cells, yet they contain bacterial cells. Mitochondria is a type of rickettsia bacteria that have been absorbed into eukaryotic cells. Uh, they have their own bacterial DNA and they replicate independently from our cells, yet they live in a symbiotic relationship providing energy in exchange for sustenance. And still, we can't say that we evolved from bacteria because evolution is an ancestor-descendant relationship defined as descent with inherent genetic modification. Whereas, uh, bacteria and other single-celled microbes often exchange genetic material on contact in a process called horizontal gene transfer. And this muddies the evolutionary lineage substantially. We can still show an evolutionary ancestry beginning with eukaryotes, but it appears to grow out of a web network because of all the horizontally exchanged genetic material. According to microfossils, the eukaryote tree of life evidently emerged a couple billion years ago but still a billion or so years after the first prokaryotes. Now from here on, we will navigate through the Phylogeny Explorer. This is a project we've been working on for a few years now. I like to describe it as an attempt to render the entire taxonomic tree of life as a navigable online encyclopedia of phylogeny, paleontology, and biodiversity. We have several dozen volunteers referencing peer-reviewed resources in an endeavor to include every identified species extant or extinct. And our goal is to get this project peer-reviewed. 
to make it a valuable tool for teachers and students as well as for the scientists themselves. We could depict this, uh, this first division as two branches, one for prokaryotes and one for everything else, but archaea are sufficiently distinct from bacteria to warrant their own grouping. The simplest eukaryotes are karyotypic of the earliest forms, meaning they resemble what the ancestor would look like. And many of them move with flagella, hair-like appendages that rotate to provide movement. Uh, some microbes have multiple flagella, and some, called biconts, have two flagella, one on either end. Biconts are in the category where you would eventually find plants. And some um, excavates are microbes showing traits similar to both plants and animals. The ones with only one flagella are called unicont, and that's us, as I'll explain in a moment. The choices between unicons are amoebozoa, which are amorphous blobs, some of which have lost their flagella, and obozoa, which are the same thing, except that they maintain a regular shape, as well as their flagella, of course. Obozoa and unicons can either have their, fla their flagella pulling from the front or pushing from the rear. One subset, called opistocots, have their flagella in the posterior position. Think of sperm cells. Those are our gamete or reproductive cells. They have a regular shape, not like amoeba. Uh, they have only one flagella and it is in the posterior or pushing position. And one subset of opistoconta is holozoa, a cell type for everything that is more like an animal than like a fungus, of which there are more options than most people would suspect. One subset of holozoa is philozoa, which includes microbial forms capable of meiotic recombination and even sexual reproduction. One subset of that is a poikozoa, which includes both animals and coenoflagellates. These can be like free-swimming sperm, but with a skirt of microvilli, which they use to feed on bacteria, kind of the way, similar to the way jellyfish feed. And these sperms in skirts are capable of sexual or asexual reproduction, which is pretty weird to think about. And most people call these collared flagellates rather than skirted. They can also live in a communal cluster. And a number of single-celled organisms can assemble into and continue on as a multicellular collective. Imagine a colony of these skirted sperms putting their heads together and arranging their skirts, or collars if you prefer, into a circle. In this configuration, they look very much like coenocytes, part of the food filtration system in sponges, one of the most primitive of all animals. In other animals, these have apparently adapt been adapted into epithelial cells. They show evidence of cell differentiation, but also gametogenesis, which is why the first animals reproduce through a release of sperm and eggs. The other subset of Apoikozoa is Metazoa, also known as Kingdom Animalia. And these are now always multicellular, and all of them, even sponges, have an internal digestive tract. And one subset of Metazoa is Eumetazoa, also known as epitheliozoa. These are the true animals, which are more advanced than mere sponges, as they have specialized cells, including epithelia, as well as nerve cells, and they are at least diploblast, meaning that they have at least two tissue layers, if not three. The difference between sponges and eumetazoans isn't as great as it seems. They start out the same, very similar to each other, and the change in both directions occurs in the development of their larvae. Remember, at, at this stage at least, neither side have any actual organs yet. Within eumetazoa, we get a choice of body plans. Radiata can be e equally divided radially in a circular or cylindrical pattern, like jellyfish and sea anemones, while bilateria are bilaterally symmetrical with a definite left and right, front to back, top to bottom. And there was once another group that established trilateral symmetry, but they didn't last long after that. Bilateria, Symmetri uh, bilaterally symmetrical animals then established a sequence of Hox genes to build the body in segments, beginning with a recognizable head, where the mouth and sensory organs are and where the nerves interconnect to begin the development of a brain. One subset of bilateria is nephrozoa, which differs from radiata in that we have a through gut from a mouth at one end to an anus at the other. And some other organisms, like the pictured anemone, uh, have to eat and regurgitate their poop out of the same cavity. More importantly, nephrozoans are triploblast coelomates, having three distinct germ layers around a body cavity separated from the outer body in a tube within a tube within a tube design. Within nephrozoa, we have another choice of developments. As soon as our eggs were fertilized, that cell divides into two, four, eight, 16, and so on, becoming a ball of as yet undifferentiated cells called a blastocyte. 
The first feature that appears is a hole in one side that forms a tunnel through to the other side. In protostomes, which lead to arthropods and mollusks and most of the other animals on Earth except for our lot and the rest of this list, the first feature that appears is the mouth and completes to an anus. But deuterostomes like us got that backwards, where the first feature that appears is the anus. And it's amusing to note that there is a moment in our development when all we have, and indeed all that we are, is an orifice surrounded by just enough cells to qualify as a butthole. <laughs> and I'm not going to make the joke that everybody expects me to make. <laughs> Beyond deuterostomes, or rather within deuterostomes, we have another important development that is best illustrated by a sister group called hemichordata. Acorn worms are among the only hemichordates that are still alive, and they show us the evolution of three features that would be impossible to discern from fossils. We have a sort of a main vein that uh, has a larger cavity in it that oscillates in a manner similar to the way jellyfish do. This shows us that the heartbeat evolved before there was a heart. And from here, the circulatory system becomes more and more efficient. These worms also have hernial holes that serve as gills, and they have a sort of proto-notochord. Proto and we see what that leads to by looking at the, the other more advanced sister group, our phylum chordata, so named because on top of these other developments, they also have a spinal cord. The earliest chordates in the fossil record appear in the Cambrian period at the dawn of the Paleozoic era, roughly 541 million years ago, meaning that all of these other evolutionary stages took place before then, in the Precambrian, being the 1500 million year period between the first eukaryotes and what could be considered the uh, earliest and most primitive type of proto-fish. One of these subsets within chordates is olfactores, if I'm pronouncing that right, I have no idea. They are so named for their olfactory adaptations, especially nostrils. Within that are craniates, which developed a protective housing around the brain. And initially, these were made of cartilage and looked like ultra-lightweight bicycle helmets. One subset of craniates is vertebrates, which combined that cartilaginous construct to envelop the entire spinal cord, creating spinal vertebrae. One of several subsets of that group is nathostomata, vertebrates with jaws, which were evidently developed out of what were gill bars. Within that group is eunathostomata, which dis are, distinguish the more advanced jawed vertebrates from the hard-shelled placoderms of the Ordovician period. And by this time, they also had pectoral fins, which were du later duplicated as pelvic fins by Hox mutations. Within that group are osteichthyes, vertebrates with ossified skeletons replacing the cartilage with bone. And this is where we split from cartilaginous chondrichthyes like sharks. Along with our bony skeleton came another adaptation called a buoyancy bladder. Uh, to help keep fish, uh, help fish keep ballast by taking gulps of air. And the thing is, is that these buoyancy bladders also have cilia in them, and so they can process oxygen and serve as lungs, which is convenient because one subset of osteichthyes is Sarcoptera GI. These are bony vertebrates with lungs and legs, at least the knobby beginnings of legs. One subset of that is Ripidistians that have symmetrical lungs. One subset of that is Tetrapodomorpha, which have a humerus bone articulating with a shoulder. So now we're talking about fish with shoulders. And one subset of that is Eutetrapodiforms, which also have a radius and ulna, the same bones in, in their arms as we have in ours. And one subset of that is Elpistostegalia, which have lost all but their pectoral and pelvic appendages, and the latter are actually connected to a pelvis. One subset of that is stegocephalia, which have the basic wrists, elbows, ankles, and toes. And one of those subsets is tetrapoda, that's four-legged vertebrates skeletally adapted for life on dry land. And remember that all of these classifications are identified by having these traits at some point in the past. But a, a phylogenetic classification is determined by ancestry. For example, humans are classified as having two arms and two legs, among other things, but if someone was born without those things, that doesn't mean that they're not tetrapods anymore, and for the same reason we wouldn't say that they're not human anymore. If your parents are human, you're human, regardless how different you may be. And if you're, and, um, 
Likewise, uh, snakes and whales are both still tetrapods, even though they don't have legs at all anymore, because we know that their ancestors used to walk around on four of them. Moving on to land in the Carboniferous period, we have the division between reptiliomorphs, which are basically things that look like reptiles, and batrachomorphs, which are actually amphibians, actual amphibians, not just the things that are amphibious. So every frog, toad, newt, salamander, or amphisbadian belongs in the sister group rather than a parental set. The difference is that amphibians can absorb other chemicals that, and even oxygen and pathogens through their moist, thin skin, whereas reptiliomorph skin is keratinized to keep the moisture in and keep chemicals and diseases out. And that keratin shows up especially in the claws at the ends of our digits. One set of reptiliomorphs are the amniotes, who no longer have to lay their eggs in water because the fetus grows in amniotic fluid. We no longer have to mate in water either, thanks to an extended appendage for transferring genetic fluids. Hopefully I don't have to draw any pictures. <laughs> and uh, as we move into the Permian, the last period of the Paleozoic era, we face another important division. Synapsida leads eventually to mammals, while Surapsida leads to reptiles, true reptiles, not just things that look reptilian, which is practically everything so far to this time at least. Now, reptiles used to be defined as cold-blooded, egg-laying tetrapods with scales and claws, but it turns out the several species that were already universally accepted as reptiles didn't meet all those criteria. Snakes and ichthyosaurs, for example, might give birth live instead of laying eggs, and most of them don't have claws since they don't have legs anymore. And does that mean they're not reptiles anymore? Then we discovered that dinosaurs and pterosaurs were warm-blooded and otherwise inarguably reptiles and descended from reptiles. So we redefined what a reptile is, so that it's anything on the seropsid side. While pelicosaurs like us, the mammal-like reptiles, aren't really reptiles at all, even though they really look like it at this stage. So from pelicosaurs, we got differentiated teeth. Yes, you know, the reptiles all have like the little cone teeth. They all look the same except, of course, for the poisonous fangs and snakes. And you have some differentiation in mammalian teeth, which is obviously where we're headed. Becoming therapsids warmed our blood, and eutherapsids turned our legs from a sideways sprawl to uh, directly underneath, you know, like mammals. And neotherapsids made our bones more mammal-like. Theriodonts gave us mucous membranes and seven neck vertebrae. Eutheriodontia gave us a secondary palate separating the nasal cavity from the mouth, which is something obviously reptiles don't have. And from cynodonts, we inherited a jaw made of a, few, made of a few bones fused into one, and a heel on feet that point forward, rather than being splayed to the side like they are in reptiles. And epicynodonts grew hair all over their bodies, just like we still have. And this brings us up to the Permian-Triassic extinction event the worst mass extinction in the history of life on Earth, which shows worrisome parallels with some aspects of climate change that we're seeing now. The survivors were called eucynodonts, whose jaws could move more fluidly than any reptile, and from their daughter and granddaughter groups, Probatonatha and Chinchodontoidea, we inherited laterally expanded thoracic ribs, having lost the lumbar ribs, thus allowing development of a diaphragm, which allows us to breathe more efficiently when we run than reptiles can. And from the next generation, Prosostrontia, we inherited dentition of four incisors and precisely occluding cheek teeth coated with prismatic enamel. One subset of Mammalia morpha, uh, one subset of that is Mammalia morpha, and one subset of that is mammalia forms, and one subset of that is, of course, our taxonomic class, mammals. And the transitions we inherited from all of these is that we have diphodont teeth, unlike other animals that we, we are born toothless because we are raised on the milk of mother's, mother's mammaries, which is why we're called mammals. Then we grow baby teeth, which fall out and are replaced by a single set of adult teeth. And where there were extra bones in our once reptilian jaws, these have shrunken and retreated to become the tiny bones of our inner ear. And does that get us up to where we are now? Not yet. We're still in the Triassic, the first period of the Mesozoic era of dinosaurs. In the next period, the Jurassic, Theriomorphs and Theriaforms gave us external ears that earlier groups didn't have. We know that because only the um, only surviving monotreme mammals, the platypus and the echidna, don't have external ears either. 
And this is where modern mammals are in a different clade from monotremes and many other mammal groups that are otherwise only known from the fossil record. There is vast biodiversity throughout paleohistory that you can only see and appreciate with a database like this one. And this one is the most voluminous and the most detailed ever created. Remember that every daughter group has sister groups too, and that each have their own slight modifications adding up to different species over time. And on most of the slides you've seen so far, every lineage you see but ours is extinct now, and often lead to hugely diverse groups that sadly only paleontologists are aware of. The next subclade, Holotheria, refers to the whole of modern mammals, meaning everything except the monotremes. And as you've already noticed, each clade is typically identified by synapomorphies, inherited traits of that lineage. And uh, usually I'm talking today about autapomorphies, which are traits that begin with and are uniquely diagnostic of that clade. For example, wisdom teeth being monophodont molars and otherwise diphodont dentition is a diagnostic trait of holotheres. One subset of holotheres, did that change? Okay. One subset of holotheres, trechnotheria, modified our arms by giving us the ability to rotate our hands like this. And they also grew a ridge in the shoulder blade that is for the supracinatus super, muscle uh, to pull our arms back further than any animal could. And this is so we can throw things or punch things. And cladotherians then gave us an inner ear canal that is coiled like a brass horn, improving our hearing. And zatharians, which is the next subset, eventually gave us nipples. Thank you very much. <laughs> From Tribus finita, we inherited a separation of the vagina and the anus. And that's convenient. <laughs> <laughs> These were once the same thing, being, uh, making two holes where there was only one for babies to be crapped out of. And that's convenient because their daughter set, Theria, are mammals that give birth live as opposed to laying eggs, as all of our animal ancestors did. And for the first time in a long time, both of the daughter groups have living descendants. Eutherians are the true Therians, like us, and Metatherians, which include the marsupials. And understand that the marsupials, kangaroos, wombats, koalas, possums, and so on, are all part of one collective that is the only surviving group of which, what, what was a much more diverse clade of metatherians way back then. Eutherians branched into several subsets in the Cretaceous, the final period of the Mesozoic era of dinosaurs. And one of them is called Placentalia. They were already born in a placenta, but uh, Placentalia are identified by the loss of epipubic bones that monotremes and marsupials all had. This was something that they used for egg laying, but it doesn't really work when you're giving live birth of fully developed babies. So those bones had to go. All four of the granddaughter clades of Eutheria have surviving members today. Atlanta genata includes Afrotheria, things from Africa, which is elephants and manatees, among other things. Xenarthra are the South American side, sloths, anteaters, and armadillos. Then our group, Boreoeutheria, is distinguished from Atlanta genata because they all share a common birth defect where their testes fail to drop out of the body. So there's something that would be noticeably absent from, the un from under the underbelly of elephants and or armadillos. Laurasiotherians is a kind of everything else category of mammals arising on the supercontinent of Laurasia, which was the supercontinent of Eurasia plus North America. Our quarter of this collective is Uarchontogliers, and we're the only one of these clades identified for what they are genetically rather than where they came from. Archontogliers are a composite clade of gliers, that's rodents and rabbits et al, plus archontids, which have forward-facing binocular vision and a host of adaptations improving the balance and dexterity necessary for living in trees, as they evidently did back then. And now we're at the point that everybody's been waiting for both the appearance of our taxonomic order of primates and the disappearance of the dinosaurs, which happened roughly the same time uh, just about 66 million 38,000 years ago. True primates are archontids with a post-orbital bar, and that's the ridge along the outside of your eyeballs. And you may be surprised to learn that a lot of other mammals don't have that. For example, did I skip? Yep, I skipped a slide. My apologies. Compare the, uh, the pit bull and a lemur, and you can see the post-orbital bar sticking out. Uh, lemurs are strepsirines, these are the most primitive primates that still exist, and they do look a bit dog-like in the face. Oh, I should point out in this previous slide, notice also that the brain case 
in the primate is substantially larger because that's another diagnostic trait of, of primates. Now, as I said, the lemurs <laughs> do look dog-like in the face. And uh, they, they even have sensory whiskers and a rhinarium, which is the nose leather or the wet nose that a dog would have. And uh, even though this is early February in Colorado, most of the people in this room still are dry-nosed primates. Most, most yes. <laughs> so there's your dry-nosed primate. Uh, from here, it gets a bit controversial. Oh, I have to, I, I skipped something here. Um, we are in Haplorini, which is a sister group of Stepsorini. These are the dry-nosed primates. And um, now it gets controversial because our subset is uh, one subset of that is simiaforms, also known as anthropoidea, uh, and both words mean the same thing, monkeys. And a lot of people get really upset about that when I point out that you're all cladistically monkey fish. Everybody gets upset only at the monkey part. <laughs> so we have to ask, what is a monkey? A monkey is any dry-nosed primate that lacks specialized sensory whiskers but has color vision and two pectoral mammae or, and a naked and pendulous penis, as in not tethered to the abdomen like they are in dogs, uh, and a large brain intelligent enough for tool use, language comprehension, deliberate deception, and degrees of awareness of self and mortality. And when you're done confirming all this for yourself by going through this list and counting your pectoral mammae to see if you qualify, you may realize that just as you belong to every other clay described in the sequence so far, so too it turns out that you're just a bunch of fucking monkeys. <laughs> now as you can see, Simiaforms monkeys has two daughter sets. New World monkeys, Platyrrhini, or Platyrrhini, and Old World monkeys, which is Catarrhini. And they each have their own set of diagnostic traits. Whereas New World monkeys have long, strong, prehensile tails, Old World monkeys have a weak, diminished, or absent tail. New World monkeys have splayed nostrils pointing outward, but Old World monkeys have downward pointing nostrils. And I'm sure everybody here has downward pointing nostrils. And all of you have fingerprints and fingernails. And these are also monkey traits, particularly Old World monkey traits. And some people think that Catarrhini uh, is modern circopith monkeys and apes, and that that's it, but that's not right. It also includes Propliopithecoidea, which is an extinct basal group of Old World monkeys ancestral to both apes and modern circopets. So one of the subsets of old world monkeys is the superfamily hominoidea, also known as apes. Aside from having no tails at all, they have a broader chest and fully rotating shoulders allowing for brachiation. They have even less olfactory capacity, ability to scent, than monkeys, and they have all the same teeth in their mouths as we do, often shaped the exact same way. They also show a greater, t a greater tendency toward bipedality, with some non-human species being exclusively bipedal. And of course, they have the same ears we do too. And yes, there are chimpanzees that, th these are not actually kissing, but there are chimpanzees that really do that kind of kissing. Okay, so, one subset of hominoidea is hominidae, also known as the great apes. Now these are, of course, larger than the lesser apes, and they have less fur, too. Occasionally, even chimpanzees will have very sparse hair. And why is it always the guys with the hairy shoulders that have the flat top haircuts? <laughs> <laughs> because of a couple mutations disabling a tumor, a tumor suppressor gene in our brains, we have encephalization, which means that our, our brain, brains have grown very, very large. And we're susceptible to brain cancer as a result of this, but the trade-off is, of course, that we have bigger brains. And other than that, the most important difference between us is in the roof of our mouth. Whereas other apes have a sort of a flattened dome above their tongue, we have a bit of a crest. And that tiny difference is what enables us to articulate speech. This is why other apes can be taught to understand our language to a degree, but they can't speak it back like we can. And that gave us another selective pressure to improve our intelligence and our ability to convey feelings and ideas and understand them better than other animals can. And hopefully, y'all understood me and you don't feel like this guy. 